Welcome back to Production Music Demystified with Media Tracks Music, a microcast of Music Works. Today we have the honour of welcoming our guest Marcel Pusey, musician and composer with ample experience in production music and director of multiple music companies. In this mini episode we will discuss what a portfolio career is, how to build one and the challenges around it. Before we move over to that, here is an advert from our sponsor. Music Works is sponsored by the Musicians' Union. I'm a member of the Musicians' Union. It's the trade union for musicians living and or working in the UK, and it's a community of 32,000 members working to protect musicians' rights and campaigning for a fairer industry, as well as campaigning to fix streaming and keep musicians working in the EU post-Brexit. The union collectively bargains for musicians working in orchestras and theatres and sets minimum recommended rates for freelance musicians working in other sectors. Its expert staff provide contract advice, legal advice and assistance, and a range of benefits and services to help musicians in every aspect of their work. Be part of something bigger and get the recognition you deserve. Join now at the MU.org. Welcome, Marcel. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. So we are going to talk about portfolio careers today. And so let's start with, with hearing about yours. Will you tell us a bit about what you do? Yeah, I um, I manage a number of companies, or I'm a director of a couple of companies. Uh, one, uh, well, there's three. There's Basis Street Music, which is the, the first business I set up, uh, which has was from a, I had a band. Well, I had a band called Basis Street, and I also uh, created a number of uh, education programs nearly 29 years ago with Basis Street Music, and then I got into technology as um, with a company called O Music, and uh, which creates uh, we we uh, created a, a music software, and I still manage that to this day. I'm a director in that company, and uh, yeah, off, an offshoot of that company is that we have another education platform called Call for School, um, which is uh, an, another on it's an online music program for uh, for kids. Uh, so I have a as many musicians do have a number of things that I juggle in regards to in terms of revenue stream but production music obviously from the bass history music side of things in terms of composition that's um uh, that's how I uh, how I got involved with uh, music production so yeah that that I with my band uh, initially the first production music that I did was um the one of the albums was taken up by a, a gentleman who who actually worked for uh, audio network actually and that's how i got involved with production music really through him i, I didn't really know much about it up, up to that point um and then yeah I, uh, some of that music was used uh, from that album uh, was used within production music and i got into it from there so it was from your um performing and composing for performance career that you that you were led into production music yeah, very much so. So what was interesting about that was, yeah, we were playing a show in, in Essex somewhere, actually. And the, the gentleman, he's quite well known within the music production world called uh, Terry Divine King. Um, and I think he was one of the original originators of Audio Network, actually. And we had trumpet. We had a in our on our album. And then for that gig, we, we had a great trumpet player called um, uh, Duncan Mackay. And he bought the album and he loved the trumpet part. And obviously he immediately saw where that could be used. It was kind of funk music, trumpet. And so he invited myself and Cassell, the beat maker, who is a, a producer I work with, to come down to his place, which blew us away because his place was like this mansion in the countryside with these huge studios outside and we were like, wow. what is this? We've never heard of you, but, um, and here you have all this. And, um, and then he just told us what what it was all about and uh, how the music was all used and, you know, where he, how he built his fortune. <laughs> and so it was a world that I had no idea about. And so he um, he asked if he could take some tracks and work with them um, and uh, and work with us, you know, so that's what we did. And so that's how I kind of started learning a bit more about how you can use your music in lots of different ways, which really suited me because the sort of music I was writing was was quite quite niche um, mm. music so 
you know, to, for it to, in terms of sales, sales were never going to be something in which I was going to be making loads of money from the sort of music I was, uh, I was uh, uh, writing. So it made a lot of sense to, to exploit it within this world of um, music production. And I would say the royalties I get for most tracks is probably after all these years from an album, which is that, yeah, you know, you know, I still get royalties from those tracks after all these years. And that's the beauty of music production. So what role then does that um, play within the sort of balance of your portfolio career that leads very neatly onto the main topic of this podcast, which is um, the role of production music within a portfolio career? Are you happy to talk about that within your own yeah, cool. um, portfolio? Yeah, of course. I mean, I would say I've probably dedicated more time to it now as, as my role as um, curator for the um, Media Tracks world. Um I, I, because I, we compose for one of our programs, and the reason why I met William from uh, Media Tracks was that over the pandemic, we we have our own library, but it's a library which is actually um, it's licensed by education. Um, so we were writing loads of music, loads of world music for this um, for this platform, but that music is available to be able to be used out in a wider world. So it it's actually <laughs> it was no extra work for me to go and write for music production. And I had been working with another music production company. I won't even say who they are uh, before um, uh, before I joined Media Tracks. Um, but it's it makes perfect sense for someone like me who's always composing music uh, for our own platform uh, to to be working with media tracks because that's what I do and it means that you're maximizing the use of your music to, to monetize it I mean it's quite you know it's quite you know they, we can make money from the the licensing it via our platform and then also the music being able to be used within the um, music production that you know that that it works perfectly yeah so it does um just curious about how you feel about the phrase passive income because this is something that comes up a lot in kind of general um portfolio career conversations a lot is how to create a passive income and there's often a feeling that there's a sort of myth that there's a, that there that passive income streams exist do you think that this is a passive income stream if you're if you are an already making the music anyway and it's just about repurposing it or is it um do you know it depends on the person or, or, or what your portfolio of work is okay so it is a passive income in the sense that um, I'm not relying on it to make a living in music. Um, I'm I'm just exploiting every avenue as a writer to make sure that my music's used or has the uh, uh, chance to be used and it can be monetized in some sort of way. So that's how I look at it. And all the people that I know who are really successful with music production, um, so the, the company I was working with before I will tell you who they are that are they're called Delhi Music um and they they've been doing it for years you know they've been in that game for years and they it's not a passive income for them <laughs> it's a oh, serious no. it, it's a seriously uh you know they've built up enough of a portfolio and that is uh all the examples I've had of people I've worked with who who are successful in this thing they've constantly been writing and they've they though they compose and they get commissioned for work and everything else like that they've built up enough of a portfolio that it's it's a significantly good revenue stream for them and that is a good example to me is that you know it's to absolutely write as much as you can and uh, get it you know get it into the production library you've got nothing to lose so yeah that's how i look at it it's like if i'm a composer in any genre it's to look at how you can export your music yeah yeah absolutely and so i was struck by the the um the story you told about how you got into this being very much about somebody hearing the music you were creating and and taking the time to sort of explain to you how it would fit into the production music world and how that world works. I think that's something that, um, that's probably the question that I hear the most when I talk to composers. Sometimes I, I you know, as you know, we work with media tracks. I recommend um, often that people talk to media tracks about working with them. And the question, the first question is always, oh, is it a right fit for me? Is there a market for my music? How do, how do I know? Well, firstly, there's a market for all music <laughs> um it's good to know. Like obviously there's certain skills or, or should i say certain things that you learn 
when you're actually putting the music together to work within the medium that is visual and the TV or, you know, um, so, and, but it is varied, it is varied, but um, so I don't think there's a limitation. If you happen to be doing, I don't know, grime or you're doing uh, uh, jazz, this, 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 these, this music will be used in some sort of medium. Um, so the important thing is to learn, learn about how you adapt it so that it can be used within production music and that's not like a big leap um mm. so that and that's all i did is i i just learned um from people who were doing it um how you go about making it something that's got more potential to be used um but that it, that you it, you really don't have to be limited by your genre you know if you, you depending on what you're kind of writing there's a there's a place for it you just have to watch tv or watch an ad and hear all the different styles of music which are used within that um mm. yeah so you're right to say Katie to go and talk to production music and, and put your music forward and see see whether they think that there's a place where it could um, uh, could could um it could, could work and not only that I think also just from a compositional point of view I think it's a great thing a great skill to um to be able to explore composing in different genres you know it's um it's uh, that's what I've learned a lot uh, just listening to different I've just done a piano album and um you know I've written piano for bands and stuff like that but then you hear it in the context as a there's a lady I, I know who's super successful called Helen Jane Long and she used to be with Audio Network years ago but she's a composer in her own right um, and you know her, does her own albums everything like that but just even listening to her piano her, her piano gets loads of placements and just listening to how she goes about doing her music I'm not saying I'm copying her because I'm not but there are certain skills that she has and you start seeing all oh, right look they place that arpeggiate itself oh they're using that kind of underscore there you know, I think you start learning those things as you, you create your music. So even when you create your music, there'll be facets of your music that you break down and go, do you know what? That part of my, my music is more likely to be used. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to use that. And I think it's it's those skills that you learn. Um, yeah. That's really interesting. So like earlier in this uh, series of uh, microcasts we've done, we've had conversations um, with people about how to, uh, about the sort of mechanics of writing for, mm. for sync. But I don't mm. think we've had a conversation about how to think about the music that you've already written and in, in the context of adapting it for sync. Is there any more kind of principles you can offer about that? Yeah, I mean, look, it, you know, one thing I'd always say is, is one, when you're watching Netflix or you're watching a programme, actually listen to what is going on. You know, listen to what melodies they use. Listen to the kind of groove. Listen to the underscore of what's going on. That gives you a good idea already because that music's being used. In my case, I, I think the, the music which is the most successful usually has had a really strong melody line because um, uh, for certain types of programs, <laughs> um, say something like um, MasterChef or Location, 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 you hear those little grooves that they play in between when they're walking here. That's where my music, you know, and you can imagine there's MasterChef or Location, Location in New Zealand and, you know, yeah, it's all over. Mm. So having a strong melody line can really work uh uh you know and and then the other thing is is just un, you know the underscores where it's hardly anything going on that's used all the time just the bed that sits there underneath um so you know so like i say for me and it, it's been the strong melody lines of horn lines which have been used uh, uh a lot and then obviously with the world music it's a uh, it's within programs which are requiring that kind of you know that, that, that kind of music and and crossover music works well as well so you can have a style of music but you put a hip-hop beat underneath it that can be work as well so yeah it's a real variety but i'd recommend you just start listening to what's out there and then within your own music go do you know what i fit there this this would work for me and yeah so the way I, yeah that's that's the way i've learned is is really really picking up on stuff that i listen to uh, um, on TV, and then obviously speaking to people who are quite experienced within that um, uh, area. But one of the guys I work with, Robert Logan, he does a lot of. Um, I've done a couple of co collaborations with him. He does a lot of documentaries and stuff, and and it's really interesting um, from a compositional point of view 
the textures that he can work with and how he creates those textures that he obviously he's working with directors all the time um and understanding you know you know you can have some dialogue here so you just need to you, we just need to leave that space there so that the dialogue can go on and you're literally what's the word for it you're 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 aware of how it could be used and therefore you make sure that you make your music adhere to the possibility of it being used in a certain way yeah. um yeah so they're, they're they're big learning uh curves that that you know um i've learned over the years is just those sort mm -hmm. of things yeah so where would you start then if you're someone listening to this who has an existing portfolio career and wants to introduce production music as a strand to it what would your first move be would you say yeah my first thing would be is to identify uh a production company so if you with media tracks you know it would be like you've got a, a load of music um you, there, there's we have something called mt connect um which is somewhere where you can upload your music or get in touch with a company and say, look, I'm, I'm writing this sort of music and let us listen to it. And then you can get the guidance because, um, you know, we'll always respond to writers who come along and say, well, look, you know, that sounds really great that that, you know, these pieces really work really well. You may need to work on it this way, this way to make it uh, workable. Is that possible? And go from there, really. So, yeah, I, I think there's never been a time more in terms of the growth within this particular industry you can imagine so many different platforms are requiring mm. music um it's become quite a competitive market now but the fact is it's a growing market it's one area of the music industry which actually is growing um, yeah. and you can if you if you're diligent and you keep putting music you, you can get a revenue from it so um yeah starting point is put you you know put together your music but make sure the music's um at a certain standard you know it has to be at a certain standard because honestly i i i listen to quite a lot of music and honestly that if, if somebody comes through and i just think uh oh, i'm literally listening to a demo with someone with some you know compared to say i'll get what could be a demo but the quality of the demo is already quite high then you're already knowing that there's not a big leap for that composer to move on to to create at a certain level you know and i think that's the thing is that don't just chuck everything maybe take your best five tracks or something like that and then put mm. don't just put loads because you'll just it, you, it just won't get listened to you know it, it's uh yeah, it's just being smart about making sure you put your best music forward as a starting point. And you can go from there. You can start writing if, if, once you've got the attention of the cure. For me, I'm a curator. Once you've got our, our attention, it's like, OK, look, I can see where you're going with that. And then you get the, you know, you can go on to the next step. Yeah, absolutely. So do just approach without, except what I took from the first part of what you said was that you don't need to wait and learn everything there is to know about production music no. before making an approach but do consider your quality and don't put too much together so your sort of small amount of your best work it's really interesting you say that about demos i was just sent a demo earlier for the part of my business that's um agency related and someone wanting to um wanting some help with releasing it and it i did in this particular case i did really struggle to distinguish the quality of the music because the quality of the demo was quite poor mm -hmm. and i was i actually had this whole conversation with myself in my head about how to respond because i was i was like i don't i, I feel like this person hasn't done themselves any favors by sending yeah. um something that's low quality sort of like end product which makes it very difficult for me to see the quality of what's behind it yeah 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 yeah. yeah i think it's one of, especially now because you know you can you, you know the quality of work that comes through from people is is incredibly high so you know that's a it's it's already sending out a message if you haven't even got it to a certain level in which you're being able to identify whether oh is it is it good is it could i use it well, you know, is there potential then you're already you know you haven't presented in its best light um, and that's not to say it's got to be the finished thing, uh, finished article, because you know I don't think we expect that. But you do expect it to uh, to be at a certain level in which you you can, you know, you can sort of give that advice back and uh, see the potential in the music. Yeah. Mm. Always a tricky thing to find the balance between, especially in, in such a perfectionist-led industry, uh, <laughs> to find that balance, isn't it? But yeah. Yeah, um, it, it is. Yeah yeah that's really useful advice thank you is there anything else you would like to share 
Um, uh, not really. I, I, I think one thing I would say is that some of my colleagues, actually, you know, who've come more from the pop industry um, and maybe the traditional way in which you make a record, you get a record deal and you you uh, get your advance and then you get this and get one of the, the hardest things is explaining to colleagues who are more from that industry about the difference between that and the music production industry and also explaining the reasons why they should have a look at doing the music production industry. So, yeah, so I would always recommend, if you if that's your, you, you, it doesn't stop you pursuing your goal in terms of as an artist, you know, you may have an album that you're gonna put out and stuff like that, it doesn't stop that. It's, it's maybe looking at it like, okay, that's one road that I'm going down, but there's also, a way in which I can use this music in other ways. And you, there's ways in which you can work that out, that you can do the same, do the both to exploit that music. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a transition because I think some of the, uh, I've had many a conversation with the colleagues who are more from that, that kind of background, trying to explain to them about it. And, uh, and I totally understand why they, sometimes they find it a bit confusing, but yeah, the, then yeah, it doesn't stop you doing the things that you want to do within your musical life. Yeah, I think that's really interesting distinction, isn't it? I think there is a myth uh, that production music is actually completely different from music that's written for concert performance or mm. sort of commercial album release. And actually sounds like what you're saying is that it is that the differences, they are there, but they're actually quite um, minute. Oh, totally. We've got an album coming out and I'm not, I've, I've, the albums I've had out have been through independent labels. I'm putting this out via media tracks because I'm not worried about the sales in terms of the sales. I'm going to try and exploit the music for the music's point within production music. And then mm. within my recording stuff, people can still go and buy the, you know, the, the down, you know, buy it as a download or anything like that. But mm. my priority is not um, the traditional way of doing a record coming out because mm. to be honest with you, I've had more success with my albums through production music than I yeah. have with the label. That's the reality. So with my type of music. Um, so yeah, I would I would definitely say it's an option for recording artists to uh, look at production music in another way um, in terms of realizing, you know, there's, you don't have to not do your record release and also be able to do production music. Yeah. And it's interesting, actually, to hear you compare the success of those two things, because actually, when we talk to our clients about record releases in the commercial sense, they are primarily for marketing purposes, really. Obviously, there is income to be made from streaming, but it is minimal. And it sounds as though not at all the same as what you're talking about if something gets picked up on the production music side, or as you say, the the bulk of um, output creates a, um, yeah. a better income stream by the sound of it. It does, it does. And also it means that you're not sitting there re relying on releasing albums every couple of years. The great thing about production music is that you're writing all the time. And there's mm -hmm. something really cool about having no limitations on how much you write. Yeah. Um, you know, so uh, I, I just think it's, uh, I just really, I just really enjoy the, the freedom of being able to write in different genres and plus having my band, which is that sort of genre and I can do the shows and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a really, you know, it's a really enjoyable, um, thing to get into with all the different composers you can work with or collaborate with and everything. Yeah. So yeah. Fabulous. Uh, tell us about your upcoming album release. It's quite soon, isn't it? It is. It's um, so it's called Short Stories. Uh, we have we're just getting it mastered at the moment. It's a really real mixture of genres, which is which is what we did with the last album. What the hell do you call this? Was a real mixture. So it's from... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what the hell do you call this? Yeah. Um, I love that attitude to naming an album. So far. well, yeah. We, <laughs> well, we may as well get in there before the journalists go. What the hell is this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, but it, that that did great. That album did in terms of uh, it was interesting that the 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 variety or didn't put. I mean, there's a thread that goes through the way I write music anyway. But like this album's got uh, my first dance track on it. It's got sort of electronica dance music. It's got African grooves on it. A whole range of stuff. But 
that you know so and really amazing players um i've got yeah uh produced by a guy called eric um Cassell, the beat maker, who's the, the drummer for The Streets, and he, he got an Ivan Novella for uh, Plan B's album, Strickland, Banks. Um, so, and all the players are just just the top top players. So it's been, it's taken us a while to do, but really pleased with it, really pleased. And uh, yeah, we're doing an album launch uh, November the 28th at Pizza Express Live in Holborn. Uh, and it will be great. It, 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 it coincides with uh, Media Track's 25th anniversary. So it will be a really great evening. I'm looking forward to it. Mm, me too. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing um, these really valuable and interesting tips and insights with us. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you about this. And you too, Katie. Great. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you.